have one of my favorite people here today with us, Dr. David Hasse. He's a good friend from the Institute of Functional Medicine. He has a clinic, the Maxwell Clinic in Nashville, Tennessee, where he's been practicing functional medicine for far longer than I have, helping people with all kinds of issues, including allergies, autoimmune diseases, and a lot of issues regarding the brain. So that's really what we're gonna be talking about today. And the title of your talk is Overcoming the Fog, Fatigue, Fear, Funk of the Autoimmune Brain. How are you? I'm great, Amy. You know, thank you very much for having me. So what does all this brain health have to do with autoimmunity? I have four basic symptoms that come up when an individual has an autoimmune condition. Whether that autoimmune condition happens to be hypothyroidism, you know, Hashimoto's thyroiditis, or Sjogren's disease, uh, lupus, um, rheumatoid arthritis, you know, fatigue is certainly one of the major symptoms that come up, correct? Mm -hmm. So what organ is, what organ governs fatigue? The brain. Ah, the brain, right. But we don't think about that, do we? We no. think, I'm just fatigued. We think it's my body is fatigued. When instead, if you give a neurochemical, you give a stimulant to somebody that stimulates their brain, ta-da! they now have energy. Mm -hmm. It's the brain that kind of tells us what our energy level is. And so when we have a gross inflammation, the cytokines and interferons are upregulated because you know, we have a leaky gut that you covered so well. You did such a great job in teaching that. Um, Thank you. When you do that um, element of health, you, you change how the overall inflammatory burden is present. It changes mm -hmm. how the immune cells in the brain the microglia actually act. And if you change how the microglia act, then you can often see fatigue improve. But guess what? Sometimes individuals get stuck into a fatigue pattern and they and just cleaning up the diet isn't enough. Mm -hmm. um, so and then the next thing, next symptom is brain fog. Mm -hmm. you know, that I see that fog. all the time. It's probably one of the biggest fatigue and brain fog are probably the two biggest autoimmunity or not, but two biggest complaints I have in my clinic. Exactly. And that brain fog is because it's it, the brain is lacking the energy it needs to carry through the tasks that it knows it can do. It's just taking extra effort. It's every, for every three steps forward, it's two steps back kind mm -hmm. of thing, right? Um, and then fear. I see anxiety being so prevalent in autoimmune disease. Hmm. And, the, the, and how many individuals come back and say, wow, you know, I really feel better. I'm more calm. I'm less anxious after we've started to deal with the fundamental problems of their autoimmune conditions um, is remarkable. And then- Well, can I ask you real quick about that with the anxiety? But do you think that part of, I mean, do you think that the anxiety is part of the cause of the autoimmunity? Or do you feel that it's a, um, it's a symptom of the autoimmunity because there's a lot of fear out there, right? You get diagnosed with an autoimmune disease, you go to a conventional doctor, you're told it's only gonna progress. Um, you have to take these really harsh medications. It's the only way to do it. There, you cannot reverse this. This is a lifelong condition. And then suddenly, you know, anxiety kicks in because you've been given this diagnosis versus if somebody's coming to see me or you, we're telling them, oh yes, you know, we can often reverse or stop this and we can get you better. We can get you off these medications. And so then therefore that fear and anxiety is lifted. Yeah. Well, it, it's always a chicken and an egg with the brain. Of course. Yes. So, so absolutely those experiences are very anxiety provoking. However, the inflammatory nature of autoimmune disease actually makes it harder for the neurons to regenerate their energy from firing. Mm. It starts to, you know, the, the more of the brain's energy is going to dealing with the inflammation rather than feeding those neurons for repetitive firing. When we do um, uh, brain mapping on individuals, we, we actually put a cap on their head, measure their brain waves, and we do a test called an evoked potential. And those individuals that have slow evoked potentials have a hard time resetting their brain or you know, have a hard time having adequate speed in their brain. And it's interesting how often this elevated, uh, elevated uh, P3A and P3B evoked potential, which basically means a slowed attention system or a slowed working memory system, how often those go along with autoimmunity. Hmm. When the brain is inflamed, it just doesn't work as fast. And when it doesn't work as fast, it gets overloaded more, free, more easily. 
So not just are people scared out of their wits about, oh my gosh, what's going to happen to me? Because the, when the people recognize that the highest risk factor for developing an autoimmune disease is having an autoimmune disease, um, that's a very fearful thing. Mm -hmm. And if you're not working with somebody who's dedicated to addressing the underlying causes of how that started in the first place, right. that would be very fear provoking. Mm -hmm. And then the last thing I put down was funk. Mm -hmm. you know, funk, just depression. I mean, literally depression. We know that, in, again, inflammation can mess up the serotonin cycle. Mm -hmm. Inflammation will cause tryptophan to not turn into 5-hydroxytryptophan, serotonin, melatonin, all these kind of happy, good chemicals, neurotransmitters, right? But instead, inflammation will cause that tryptophan to, to be sucked away into making an, a brain irritant called quinolate. And that quinolate is actually not just a brain irritant, but it's a... So you're getting this tryptophan, this remarkable amino acid, getting pulled away from what will help with your mood and going towards a chemical that can actually exacerbate depression, can exacerbate the problems. So, um, yeah, so, but in that case, I see autoimmune disease being very much the cause of depression. Mm -hmm. But why is it that we have many individuals with autoimmune conditions, correct? Mm -hmm. And some have fee fatigue, some have fog, some have fear, some have funk. Not everybody has the same thing. Right. That goes back to how is our brain wired in the first place? What are our susceptibilities? What is the weak link in our chain? And when that inflammation occurs, wow, you're going to irritate the weak link in the chain of the brain. And so that's why, you know, we see one condition, you know, one named condition, autoimmune thyroiditis. Mm -hmm. We see so many different symptoms coming out of that, right? Mm -hmm. Because the person's underlying biochemistry is unique. If you just segregate out the symptoms that come from the brain, um, we always have to honor the person. Right. In the process. So what is brain mapping? You sort of alluded to it, but what is that? Okay. Um, brain mapping is a w any way that we can understand how the brain is functioning and we can put it on paper. Mm -hmm. There's many different ways you can brain map. There's some very expensive ways uh, using spec imaging or functional MRI or PET scanning that may or may not use radioactive elements to do that. And then there's a pretty easily accessible tool uh, called EEG brain mapping. This is where we put a cap on your head and there are 19 little electrodes in that cap. We squirt some uh, electroconductive gel in those little uh, connectors to your skin, and we measure your brain waves. Take your brain waves and we put them through an evidence-based or an FDA-registered database of average normal brains. And then we see how does your brain differ from this average normal. And okay, hold on. How do you figure out what average normal is? That's the what I was just going to say. <laughs> I mean, considering it's sort of like, you know, a thyroid test compared to all the people out there, but most everybody's walking around hypothyroid and obese and, you know, we've become such a sick society. How do you get somebody who has a normal brain? Yes. And so that goes a little deeper. And I'm, I'm going to digress for a second because when we assess the brain, we look at four different things. One is your story. You know, what, you know so that's all your symptoms your problems, what you think is the issue, right? Mm -hmm. The second is your soup. That's all your biochemistry. The third is your skill. This is when we have you actually do uh, brain stress tests, right? Where you're doing a um, repetitive task or a difficult task, a memory task, a processing speed task, mm -hmm. and those are normed. There's a group of people that we know, the population, uh, general performance. So that's skill and the last is spark. That's the electrical baseline of the brain. So you don't ever assess the brain with just one of those because the brain is a very complex organ. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's just thinking of like a mountain, you want to come at it from many different angles. Mm -hmm. right? You want to come from several different angles. And that would be, um, so again, story, soup, skill, and spark. 
And so the spark is the part I'm talking about with brain mapping. Okay. And so it's one angle. And you ask, well, what's normal? I was trying to interrupt you and say, yeah, there are no normal brains. Thank the Lord, there are no normal brains. But if you take the group of people, which is, you know, 100 individuals that make up the database for a particular age group, if you take any one of those persons and compare them against the database, they will still have things that look to, like they have more or less of a particular brain wave. Mm -hmm. So even the, even the people new, used in making the database aren't going to be all, quote, average. We love uniqueness. And just because we see a uniqueness on a brain map doesn't mean that that person has a problem. That could be a particular genetic underpinning. That could be a particular gifting. And so, um, but it's amazing when you do a brain map on people and they get to see their brain and now they sit back and they have this experience of going like, wow, I'm not to blame. You know, this is my brain. It's, uh, it's not my soul. Let's say, let's talk about this, that your brain is your issue here in the, you know, in your frontal lobes. There's a very a huge asymmetry in the alpha brain wave, and that's highly correlated with individuals that have depression. Mm. And we know that individuals with this type of asymmetry tend to respond to a particular type of neurofeedback. Mm -hmm. which, and so at one time, there is, this is what good data does for people. Both, it gives them a good direction, so they start to take action, and it can take, remove some of their guilt and their shame. And now they can move forward with more joy and saying that, you know, all right, I now know the problem. It's not me. It's not my soul. It's my brain. Mm -hmm. That's actually a very helpful way to look at it. And so where does somebody get this brain mapping done? Are there certain people who are trained in brain mapping? How does somebody find somebody mm -hmm. that does that? So um, I would say... Uh, there are several different ways to get a brain mapping done. Um, there's companies that do brain mapping. One of them uh, that I like and have work with is called Evoke Neuroscience. And you can actually go to www.evokeneuroscience.com and they will help you find a practitioner. Mm -hmm. um, likewise, um, there is a professional organization called ISNR, International Society for Neurofeedback Research. And uh, that's isnr.net, I believe. And um, that's another good resource to find somebody that can help you with brain mapping. But explain the difference between biofeedback and neurofeedback. So biofeedback is making the, un the unconscious conscious. It's, it's so imagine holding a thermometer in your hand and willing it to get hotter. Mm -hmm. And do this. It's, it's actually quite simple to do. You can train your skin to get warmer and train your skin to get cooler. And so that's making the unconscious conscious. That's biofeedback, and it, biofeedback can be done with temperature, with the amount of sweat on your skin, with the amount of muscle tension that goes on. Um, it can be done with the respiratory rate, heart rate, all of those biological functions, biofeedback. Neurofeedback is biofeedback using brain waves. Hmm. And so uh, you are placing an electrode on someone's head and just watching what electricity do they make, what kind of brain waves do they produce. And as they make those particular brain waves, um, you help them become aware of that. And you set a goal. All right, this individual wants to have a higher state of focus. So we're going to have them increase the amount of beta in one part of their brain, which is a fast brain wave associated with concentration, and decrease theta in the frontal area of the brain. And now you're going to have um, when the person manages to raise beta and lower theta, they get a reward. Mm. And the reward is as simple as looking at a screen on a computer and having a movie get bright and loud. And when the brain moves away from making the brain waves we want to reinforce, the movie gets dark and quiet. And so the brain wants to watch the movie. Mm -hmm. So it figures out this electrical combination lock to turn on so the movie will stay bright and loud. And it works because neurons that fire together wire together. So that's what neurofeedback is, is training the brain 
to wire in a way that's more efficient. How would that be, uh, I guess, sort of the implications of that in something like autoimmunity or chronic disease would be that if, if something uh, like your disease is creating inflammation in the brain and maybe causing you to spike, you know, in the area of depression or anxiety, that then you can train the brain to calm that down. And then in theory, that would be calming the rest of the body down and helping with the disease. A couple of different, a couple of different angles here. So okay. one is, uh, let me give you a case example. Okay. The uh, 40-something-year-old um, oncology pediatric nurse, delightful soul, uh, came to me with fatigue, tiredness, brain fog, anxiety, and really uh, had a, uh, just a, it was being quite beside herself. She'd seen several physicians, and she'd been recommended to go on thyroid hormone because her TSH was hovering around 9 her anti-TPO antibodies were in the 200 range, and um, she didn't want to do that. She didn't, didn't want to go the thyroid route. So we had a discussion about her anxiety and her brain fog, and we started her on uh, an excellent elimination diet using an anti-inflammatory medical food, uh, fish oil, probiotics. Um, in, and when she came back about a month later, yeah, about 50% of her symptoms were down. She knows her anxiety was less. Um, was doing better, and so we said, well, good, let's continue another month. We rechecked her labs, her TPO antibodies had dropped down into the double digits now, her TSH had come down to a 3.2, you know, so her thyroid was healing very quickly, actually, on this restricted diet. Anxiety still wasn't what, it, what she wanted it to be. When I asked further, has this been a lifelong problem for you, she said, well, not really, maybe since high school. Uh, and she didn't identify that it was a, a major issue for her. So we're seeing all these biochemical parameters better. We continued on the diet for, again, another month. She didn't notice any additional improvement in any of her other well-being. We had done other biochemical evaluations, fatty acids. Uh, we had looked at her gut function. A, a lot of the other things that you and I, as functional medicine docs, have, I would, you know that I would already have looked at, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, so there weren't those avenues, but she was still stuck with anxiety to the level that she was not enjoying her work and she was unable to function as highly as she wanted as a wife and a mother. And um, she thought this was all because of her thyroid. So we started neurofeedback with her. We found a brain, her brain map that had improved her brain map. That's an important point. Her brain map actually improved on just the diet. Oh, wow. Her, her beta waves came down, so we could see objective markers of brain function improving with a, a standard elimination diet support structure, uh, something we call our restoration experience. And the, um, so we started neurofeedback, and it was remarkable how her anxiety came down now to only about 10% of what it had been. Mm -hmm. And, um, at an additional 10 sessions of neurofeedback, her report to me was, she said, listen, I now love my work. I feel it a calling to serve these parents, to be there in stand in the gap for them at this incredibly stressful time in their life. I've never felt my job as a calling. I've never had joy in the midst of everything, knowing that I am the right person to be here at this time. She said, and that's because I don't have anxiety. Awesome. I'm actually able to be more fully who I have always been, and so, you know, just I teared up. Oh, I have goosebumps right now. So yeah, I mean, because but it's how do you get people that next level? Now, my hypothesis was that her autoimmune conditions actually started back when she was a teenager in, in college, and I think that the ongoing inflammation in the brain was such a stressor to her long term that she wired herself to get used to being anxious. Because mm -hmm. anxiety, you know, if you give somebody a lot of cortisol and a lot of norepinephrine, uh, you know, a lot of adrenaline, they're going to be more anxious, right? Well, those are our antidote hormones to inflammation. Mm -hmm. So if chronic inflammation, high antidote hormones present, and you train your brain to be anxious over the long course of time. So tell us, I mean, we, we've heard a lot about leaky gut, but we haven't heard as much about leaky brain. What exactly is that? And what are the causes of that? Many of the same connectors that hold together epithelial cells in the gut 
are holding together what we call the blood-brain barrier. And these are connections from the, uh, that are controlled from the inside of the brain to either allow nutrients into the brain or to uh, allow places for um, toxins to get excreted from the brain. When the brain's been injured, especially in a head injury, you know, a concussive whack, you get a bruise. And that bruise can breed to the blood-brain barrier, not just the tissue underneath. And now you get more leakage of antibodies into there. So any type of immune upregulation is going to affect that area more. So um, you know, leaky brain is a component of most every head injury. Um, and some of the same chemicals that cause leaky gut to occur also cause more of the leaky brain to occur. And I think this is part of the brain fog. This mm -hmm. is why we see healing happening over the course of time. There's initial wonderful gains when you make dietary changes. Mm -hmm. And then cleaning up that mess to really get back to optimal function can take some time, depending upon the individual, correct? Mm -hmm. And what would be, you know, how could somebody know besides a head injury um, if they have leaky brain? Are there some signs or symptoms? I mean, you mentioned brain fog, but yeah. for the listeners it's out there that are kind of curious, do I have leaky brain? Yeah, there's not one single test, you know, that we can measure a, a blood sample that's, that's consistent. There are some that are in the workings. I'm uh, visiting a new metabolomics laboratory actually on Monday talking about um, another way of looking at blood-brain barrier integrity. So mm -hmm. um, there's not a single blood test one can do, um, but instead if you have a leaky gut, uh, leaky brain is very much a likelihood. Or if you've had a head injury, really at any time in your life, leaky brain may be an issue. And leaky brain is so hard to define because what if it is just a, a focal abnormality, one very small spot of the brain? Mm -hmm. uh, we can see brain irritation on the EEG. Yeah, you know, it depends upon where the injury happens uh, with regard to a head injury, what kind of symptoms you're going to have. Um, for instance, one of my patients right now actually has a head injury and also has um, dermatomyositis. Now, what a challenging case she presents uh, because she has these dual conditions going on. Will you just tell people what that is because they may not know. Even though it's an autoimmune com condition, they may not have ever heard of it. Yeah, if it's a big, long, scary sounding right. thing, it's probably an autoimmune condition, right? All right. Uh, uh, dermatomyositis is, to break it down, there's an itis, an inflammation. So dermato is skin, myo is muscle, inflammation. And uh, this can be characterized by elevations of, of muscle proteins in the blood, um, by changes to the skin, a lot of pain, a lot of aching. Um, a very debilitating condition. Mm -hmm. and, um, and of course, she has leaky gut as well as uh, co-infections on stool analysis that probably cause something called molecular mimicry, uh, where those, those particular bacteria trigger an immune response against that person's own tissue. Mm -hmm. So she had all of those going on as well as antibodies against uh, aflatoxin. So mm. Aflatoxin uh, this was done on Cyrex Panel 11, uh, which I've really been impressed with in clinically. I haven't used that one yet. In, in very in difficult cases, it's mm. a very helpful test um, because uh, it looks at the toxins, molds, and how do these nasty molecules actually attach themselves to your functioning molecules mm. and thereby turn what looked normal to their immune system to looking like an outsider, an invader, and triggering an autoimmune response. Mm -hmm. So um, she had very high levels of aflatoxin, which is a mold that's found on peanuts and beans. So we changed her diet. It's to, also in houses. I, yeah, I, houses. Yeah. So anyway, we can talk after this if you yeah. need some guidance on that. That's great. That would be great. Yeah. Let's talk more. And, um, and, what a, um, and so if you remove those triggers uh -huh. for her, um, then she has a potential. Did, to did she get improvement from removing the beans and the peanuts? Yes, she did. She, she did. She, we had already removed grains, uh -huh. removing legumes, unless that she washed them. You know, she washed, soaked, mm -hmm. and re 
and change the water out several times because mm -hmm. aflatoxin doesn't get broken down by cooking. Mm -hmm. uh, that's that's one of the difficult parts of aflatoxin. And um, because she had been eating a lot of beans. In her oh, diet, she had. Okay. And she, and she also noted that when she made her own hummus, she was fine. When she would get some store-bought hummus uh, that had a good ingredient list, she felt awful. <laughs> because she had the habit when she made her own hummus, she would make chickpeas, soak them, wash them, rinse them, and then blend them, which would probably get rid of some of those aflatoxins. Mm. So very, to continue the process of digging, to always be curious mm -hmm. about what is there, I want to encourage anybody listening to this, please don't give up. Do not stop asking why. Keep thinking of what, the body is not meant to attack itself. Mm -hmm. It is not designed to do that. So what is off? Um, it, is, is, it takes such courage to stick with that question. Mm -hmm. It takes such tenacity. And if you can't stick with it, consider that your brain may be getting in the way of your healing. So The other is, is that you know, people don't often have access to physicians like ourselves, which is one of the main parts of this summit, is to offer people guidance and help. And that when they're seeing a practitioner who isn't asking the whys, you know, it's really, um, it, it, it can be frustrating and overwhelming and disheartening, right? I mean, when you're like, I read this book and I heard this talk and I wanted to talk to you about this and the other doctor is poo-pooing it and saying there's nothing to it, you know, they just don't know where to go. They don't know where to turn. And so it's also just kind of a you know bummer that that you know that they're wanting that why but they're not getting it from their practitioner yeah so and, and my and my patients teach me so much mm -hmm. I am so honored that my patients spend so much time researching their own health and you know I think of all of them as like my research assistants <laughs> so I have this army of research assistants finding what's latest and what's newest and they're always trying to scoop me yeah Okay. Yeah, me too. I always say, I'm like, I don't have an ego about it. Like I'm, I have so much time that I'm spending doing all this other stuff. If you have like something really obscure that I haven't seen yet and you want to get on blogs and forums and somebody's tried something, as long as it's not anything that's unsafe, let's try it. You know, I mean, that's, I love that, you know, learning every day, every that's day. so great because you, you just said, you said, as long as it's safe, right? Right. Um, it, it's that we, it, it, we're always running an experiment of one. Yes. You know, every one of us is unique. Let's run that experiment of one. And results are the only thing that matter. Right. And I think if we keep that in mind, that results are what matter. And yeah, that was one thing. I, I made this sound like Jeff Bland hit me out of the blue with functional medicine. I was very frustrated with the becoming kind of a, a legal drug pusher. You know, I was realizing my job was not as an allopathic doc was not to create health, but rather to treat disease. Mm -hmm. And the two of those are, the two of those are not, are not necessarily synonymous, right? Those are two different tracks. They're both important. They're both important. But my passion is in creating health. So with histamine intolerance, yes, this is where histamine. Um, we think about it a lot when we take things like, that are antihistamines, like mm -hmm. Benadryl or Zyrtec, Claritin, to treat allergies. Um, and, or when you get a hive, you know, that would be a swelling on your, on your skin or a welt. Um, that's being caused by histamine being released in the skin. Now, think of that welt. That means that histamine has caused the blood vessels to become acutely leaky. It has opened them up so that fluid can gush into that space and maybe dilute the poison that's there. Histamine is a defense molecule for it. It's very important. And um, we also have, um, but histamine works the same way everywhere in the body. So if you have very high histamine levels in the bowel, it will cause those epithelial cells, the lining cells in the gut to spread apart and will cause an acute leaky gut for individuals. There are two major enzymes that break down histamine. One is histamine methyltransferase, and that has to do with the whole methylation process. Um, and then there's also diamino oxidase, which is a enzyme that breaks down histamine in the bowel. And this enzyme also floats around the bloodstream, breaking down histamine. So when individuals have, a, have an injury pattern, 
they will, um, so say they've eaten dairy, um, have, when you're sensitive to dairy, boy, you can have a, you know, cause a lot of injury to the inside of your gut. And now some of those little villi where uh, the absorptive surface of the bowel, um, you have a breakdown of the enzyme you no longer produce this diamino oxidase. So a leaky gut can't make the enzyme to break down histamine. Well, that becomes a double whammy, doesn't it? Uh -huh. So you have a leaky gut. Now you can't make the enzyme that breaks down histamine, which is another factor for causing an acute leaky gut. And so when you eat foods that are really high in histamine, you can't break them down. And that we call this histamine intolerance syndrome. And um, by taking a, uh, taking a supplement that contains diamino oxidase, uh, you're able to actually break down the histamine in the gut, stop that ongoing repetitive histamine-induced leaky gut, and actually improve the process of healing. Mm -hmm. You know what's cool, Amy, is that DAO levels in the bloodstream are actually a really good marker for how much of this villous injury you have how bad the leaky gut is. So I find that measurement to be very helpful. Um, I get mine done through Dunwoody Labs, and they have a, an excellent marker for measuring this diamino oxidase as well as zonulin, which I'm sure uh, you've talked about quite a bit already. Yes, and we have uh, Dr. Fasano on the, on yeah, the yeah, summit yeah. as well. Um, yeah, I mean, I use them as well after you introducing me to them, and I love that test because it gives you a zonulin level, it gives you the DAL level, and the histamine level. And, you know, those of us, I've had autoimmunity. I mean, you know, everybody thinks, oh, my gosh, you're so perfect. You, you know, live this whole lifestyle. But I've, you know, I got exposed to molds. And then, I mean, who knows what happens, you know, over time that we get other exposures and can slip backwards. So I found that, you know, I actually was having a leaky gut. My DAL was low. I was eating, of course, all the high histamine foods of, you know, bacon. I'm eating a paleo diet with bacon and avocado and, you know, and then so I removed those foods, uh, worked on, you know, healing my gut again, and then took the supplement. And then, you know, I was a nut. I was like, I'm not putting anything in my mouth unless I have that supplement. And it's expensive because apparently it comes from cows in Europe. Pigs. Oh, pigs. I thought it was cows. And, um, you know, it was like not eating a bite without one of those supplements. And then l very quickly, I mean, within a matter of weeks, was able to, you know, not need to use it, retested, zonulin down, no leaky gut, you know, DAL, everything great. And I mean, if I eat a super high histamine food, uh, you know, meal, I might take some just prophylactically here and there. But right. I mean, and, and I just, I love the, um, seeing the whole big picture, seeing it fit together. And then I love fixing it and seeing it clinically get fixed and then, you know, repeating tests. Because not all my patients want to repeat tests because they get, I tell them, you know, there's no, it's expensive, you feel better. You know, if you want to spend the money on it, I always love the data, but I understand if you don't want to spend the money on it, but I always spend the money on myself. You know, it's where I, all my resources go to testing. So I'm always doing and then retesting. So I loved being able to see that like before and after, because I don't ever get that satisfaction, you know, the pay, or not that I don't, but I don't frequently get that satisfaction. I get the satisfaction of the patient getting well, but not always the lab to prove it. If it's one of these out of pocket, you know, tests that you have to do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and you know what I love about DAO is that it, it follows the important rule that a great therapy is one that the more you use it, the less you need it. Mm -hmm. You know, that's when we know we're inducing healing. Mm -hmm. and I love to focus on therapies that the more we do them, the less we will need them in the future. Right. And, and that's, that's, good. that's really when we're creating health. It's one of the things I love about neurofeedback. Instead of putting on a person on a medication long term, what ends up happening is you can help train the brain to be healthier long term, to actually change, to have a new, have a different brain to carry forward. The last question before we part is many people can't see a functional medicine doctor. So we're trying to give them three to five tips that they can do today, right now, um, to either prevent or reverse autoimmune disease. Mm -hmm. You have some suggestions mm -hmm. for our listeners out there? I, I do. I have. I have one big one. Okay. Right? One big one. And it's paced breathing. So there's a very simple technique that does amazing things to your brain and it does amazing things to your gut, uh, which is paced breathing. This is a simple technique of a, of a slow inhalation of five seconds in, 
five seconds out, five seconds in, five seconds out, and focusing on gratitude and thankfulness during the process. And what you're doing on a biological level here with this nice, slow, kind of yogic breathing is you're massaging your vagal nerve. This is a nerve that wraps all the way down your esophagus and your stomach and your guts, and you're massaging that nerve. And what happens is the nerve uh, starts to signal to the brain to say, turn off your stress signal. And as a result, when the brain turns off its stress signal, lowering cortisol um, and improving your immune function becomes more targeted. It becomes more, better behaved, shall we say. And then, not just not only that, when you do paced breathing, you'll start to relieve more, release more of cholecystokinin. This is something pretty new. And cholecystokinin not just releases more digestive enzymes and releases more bile, so you digest your food better and you um, it decrease all of, you improve all of the factors that lead towards leaky gut. Cholecystokinin is also directly helps regulate the stress response in the brain. So here we have this wonderful, simple technique of paced breathing in gratitude. Improving that mealtime gratitude has massive effects. This is not a little thing. So sit down and pace breathe. Nice, slow, in, out, five seconds. Um, experience incredible gratitude. You know, have thankfulness for the food that's in front of you. How long do you do that for? Hmm? How long do you do that for? Uh, 30 seconds. Oh, okay. I would really say that no less than 30 seconds. Okay. And um, quite an experience, actually, to sit down at a meal and do that for 10 minutes before you eat. It is an amazing experience. And how you taste food and how that becomes electric on your palate and, and your bowels are so ready to do their job of digestion and assimilation uh, on a level that you just don't get in our, you know, whew, you know whisk through our workday kind of a, you know, think that just because we put food in our mouth, we're nourishing our bodies. Right. You know, that's, that's really not the case. But if I only had one tool the rest of my life to give all of my patients, it would be pace breathing. And I've said that for 10 years because I've never seen something so simple, safe, effective, and cheap produce such massive results in people's lives if consistently used.